All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our RBT practice series where we're going through questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, or welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. As always, when you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A client bangs on the table at random points throughout your session. Your supervisor asks you to take partial interval recording data on banging on the table and sets the interval at 20 seconds. Three times in a row, the client bangs on the table at 19 seconds. How many responses should you record? We have a measurement question. Specifically, we are looking at how many responses you're going to record. When you're measuring behavior, your primary objective is to take accurate, reliable data, meaning you want to capture what is happening. In this case, what type of measurement are we using? Well, we are using partial interval recording. And with partial interval recording, the discontinuous measurement system where we set an interval, our interval is at 20 seconds. And if the behavior happens at any point during that 20 seconds, we record a response. The difference between partial and whole interval, with whole interval, the behavior would have to occur the entire time. So it would have to occur all 20 seconds. Partial, if it occurs one second, a half a second, if it occurs at any point during the interval, it counts. So if our interval is at 20 seconds, and then three times in a row, the client banged on the table at 19 seconds, did the behavior occur? It did. Did it occur every interval? It did, right? Three times in a row, the client banged on the table at 19 seconds, meaning each interval, 19 seconds in, the client banged on the table. Now it's worded a little strange, right? But we've getting, we got to the end of one interval and at 19 seconds, they banged on it. We got to the end of the second interval, client banged at 19 seconds. And then the third interval, client banged 19 seconds. So how many responses are you going to record? Well, of course, three, because each interval, the behavior occurred once for a split second, but it still occurred. So we are going to record three total responses. Harold wants to help his dad prepare a Thanksgiving dinner this year. His dad tells him he can help him by going to the grocery store and buying everything they need. His dad gives him a list of items, including the specific brands that Harold needs to buy. What skill is most important when Harold is looking at the different brands in the store? First things first, what is the question asking? It's asking about the skill that Harold needs when looking at different brands. Now remember, there's Harold and his dad. Whose behavior are we looking at? Harold's. Always identify whose behavior you're looking at. In this case, it is Harold. Harold must do what? Harold needs to go to the store because he's helping his dad prepare dinner. So he's going to the store and buying what he needs. His dad gives him a list of items, but specifies brands. Meaning, if Harold goes to the store and needs orange juice, he needs to buy a specific type of orange juice. So what skill is most important for Harold when looking at different brands? A, response generalization. With response generalization, we have a single stimulus, different responses are occurring. We don't need different responses here. We need Harold to just pick the item and buy it. So we're not worried about Harold engaging in different responses in the store. What Harold needs to do is pick the right stimulus. He needs to pick the correct brand. So if he's got four different brands in front of him, what does Harold need to be able to do? B, differentiation. Differentiation, also called response differentiation, is when you're engaging in different types of behavior. You're differentiating your responses. Again, we don't need a Harold to engage in a bunch of different responses. We need him to buy the food. Select the food, buy the food. That's it. What Harold has to do is discriminate. And why is that? Well, if he's got four different brands of orange juice, Harold needs to be able to discriminate between different brands. So the skill that is most important when Harold is looking at different brands in the store is going to be C, discrimination. Ask yourself, am I worried about the responses here or the stimuli? And we're really worried about the stimuli because we just need Harold to pick the right one, but he's got to be able to discriminate between the different stimuli. Every month, you must log your hours into your company's database. The process is a five-step chain that you know by heart. 
Today, your company tells you they are adding an additional step to the chain for security purposes. What type of chaining would likely be the quickest way to teach the new step? So we have a chaining question, task chaining, right? Task analyses create task chains, and then we can teach task chains in a variety of ways. We want to find the quickest way to teach the new step in this chain. And what is the chain? Well, you must log your hours into your company's database. It's a five-step chain that you know by heart, meaning you've mastered this chain. You have no problem with the chain. However, today, your company says we're going to add an additional step, meaning that five-step chain you know now has an additional step. So the question becomes, do we have to reteach this entire chain? Well, no. You know five of the six steps. All you have to do is learn that additional step. We're looking for the fastest way. Reteaching every step makes no sense. You already know them. So what's the fastest or quickest way to teach the new step? A, forward chaining, B, backwards chaining. In both forward and backwards chaining, we're going to be teaching individual steps. You already know all five steps. So why not do C and teach the entire task chain all at once? With total task chaining, we're teaching the entire chain, and then we can hone in or be specific about certain steps. In this case, likely the new additional sixth step. What about behavior chain interruption strategy? Well, you don't necessarily teach new responses in the behavior chain interruption strategy. When you interrupt the chain, what you're hoping for is that the client engages in a different response, but you're not going through teaching steps in the behavior chain interruption strategy. So the quickest way to teach these new steps, given you already know five of the six, is through total task chaining. Lorraine tells her son to put the forks on the dinner table, so he grabs the utensils and puts them where they go while holding an action figure in his hand. When Lorraine grabs the action figure and puts it on the counter, her son bursts into tears. What is the likely function of crying? When identifying the functions, escape tangible attention automatic, we are looking for antecedents and consequences. Typically, consequences are going to tell you the most, but antecedents help. What happens before, in this case, the crying? What happens after? What is going on in this scenario? Well, we know Lorraine said to her son, put your forks on the dinner table. So he, he does it. He puts them where they go while holding an action figure. Immediately to me, that says, well, he's not escaping, right? Because she gave him a demand, he did it. However, he's holding an action figure in his hand. Lorraine then grabs the action figure and puts it on the counter, which leads to what? Well, her son burst into tears. Why is he crying? Well, what happened right before, his action figure was taken away. To me, it seems like the consequence that would stop the crying is getting the action figure back. Because that is the antecedent that evoked crying. A says escape, but he didn't try to escape because when she told him put the forks on the table, he did. So B, tangible, looks a lot more likely considering right before crying, his tangible got removed. C, attention. He's already got attention, right? His mom is talking to him. They're in the kitchen together. He's not really desperate for attention. He already has attention. He's looking to get that action figure back. And then it can't be automatic. Why? Because automatic is when the behavior produces its own consequence. There's nobody else involved. In this case, there are two people involved. It can't be automatic. It's socially mediated. The likely function of crying is getting the tangible back. He wants the action figure back. You work with a client two days a week in their school and two days a week in their home. Your supervising analyst changes the home reinforcement schedule to a FR2, which will provide more reinforcement than before. To try and avoid behavior contrast, what should be done following the change? Harder question. We're looking at behavior contrast. What does behavior contrast say? Behavior contrast says when a behavior is increased or decreased in one environment due to a change in schedule usually, if the schedule doesn't change in a different environment, the behavior is going to move in the opposite direction. So in this case, you're in the school and in the home with the client. Your analyst changes the, the schedule, the reinforcement schedule, to an FR2 in home. Now, if that schedule is effective in home and we don't change in school, what's likely to happen? What's likely to happen is the behavior at school is going to go to the opposite direction. So if we increase the behavior at home, it's likely to decrease at school. That's behavior contrast. So to try and avoid behavior contrast, 
What's the logical next step? A, a punisher should be used in school. Well, no, there's no you need to jump to punishment. Punishment's the last resort. There's a very simple solution here. We've already changed the schedule at home, so B, the reinforcement schedule should be changed in school as well. Absolutely. That makes the most sense. Everything we do should be cohesive. It should be as a team. It should be collaborative. If we're changing something in school, let's try to change it in home and vice versa. Changing the schedule at school makes the most sense. C, you should not increase reinforcement in the home. Well, not necessarily, right? We don't really care about that part. That part's fine. Just if you're in school and at home, those schedules should ideally match unless there are special circumstances, especially when talking behavior contrast. The best thing to do is try to match those schedules. So the reinforcement schedule should be changed in school as well as home. Four girls are talking during class while the teacher is trying to deliver her lecture on the Civil War. The teacher sends all four girls to the principal's office. Without knowing how the girls' behavior changed following being sent to the principal's office, what can we say for sure about the girls being sent out of class? Think about this. What is the question really asking? So we don't know how the girls' behavior changed following be being sent to the principal's office. Why is that the issue? Okay, why is that the issue? Because we're looking for what do we know about the girls being sent out of class? And that was a consequence because they're talking during class, and so they get sent out. It's a consequence. In order to determine the effects of a consequence, we need to know future behavior. In this case, we don't. We just know they got sent out. So we know it was a, we know it was a consequence. We know for sure A is right. It is a consequence. Can you be sure it's reinforcing? Well, no. We don't know how the behavior changed. Can you be sure it's punishing? Well, no. We don't know how the behavior changed. And so if given a scenario like this where it's specifically asking about the consequence and you don't know future behavior, all we know is it's a consequence. Now, if you get a consequence question and they don't specify what happens in the future, but they only give you reinforcing and punishing, punishment consequences, then as usual, we have to go with the best answer. Here, the best answer, it's a consequence. Without knowing how the girl's behavior changed, we all we know is that it's a consequence. Until we figure out how it affected them in the future, we cannot say for sure it's reinforcing or that it's punishing. So the answer here is A, it is a consequence. Regardless of what the behavior plan or treatment plan tell you to do in response to a maladaptive behavior, ethically, what is your top priority? A little refresher on ethics and our top priority. As a technician, you, are, you have a lot of responsibilities. What is your number one responsibility? Take care of the client. Your client is always number one. No matter what the plan says, no matter what anybody says, you have to take care of your client first. So what is your top priority? A, make meaningful changes in the client's life. Very important. Extremely important. One of the most important things about our jobs is we make meaningful changes in both the client and B, the parent's life. Is that our top priority? Well, let's keep reading. C, deliver the best treatment that you possibly can. 100%. However, D, do no harm, keep the client safe. In some circumstances, extreme circumstances, keeping the client safe and doing no harm might not be best treatment. You might not be making meaningful changes, but you always prioritize safety above literally everything else. Your number one objective, do no harm, keep the client safe. Thank you for watching. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials. Subscribe if you have not. Please let us know when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard. Study hard. See you soon.